Hey, welcome everyone to another episode of Fortinet Live. I'm Rick Peters, uh, the CISO for Operational Technology for North America, and I'm joined today with Joe Robinson, my colleague from Europe and CISO in, in that uh, AOR. Welcome, Joe. Hey, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you here uh, today, Rick. It's, it's always a, a treat, uh, Joe, to share conversation with you. We're both passionate about operational technology and all the energy we're pouring into raising the bar, not just here in North America, of course, but globally. We share that responsibility, that charge of bringing better, secure, reliable services to our citizens around the globe. So it's an exciting topic. And what's interesting is uh, Fortinet has just produced our 2021 State of Operational Technology and Cybersecurity Report that's fresh and ready. And so we're going to dive into that, that topic a little bit today and get some, get some themes and a sense of what's really bubbling up, what's important to executives that are responsible and charged to lead uh, operational technology and securing all the verticals, right, from manufacturing to energy and utilities to transportation. There's a lot of responsibility out there. And clearly, uh, OT organizations continue to experience intrusions. Our report uh, clearly illustrates that, you know, seeing large growth and, in fact, sustained kind of breach rates. You want to comment at all on that before we go any deeper? Yeah, I think it's really significant that the uh, the attackers, the bad guys, have cottoned on to the fact that OT is out there and it is critical, it's crucial to companies. And they realize that they, they can really make money on ransomware for uh, being able to shut down the, the company's uh, production lines because you know, that's the heart of their business. And uh, so it's not surprising that there's more and more attacks in that OT environment, which just raises the, the question of how do you protect it? How do you protect it better? Yeah, I think certainly and arguably uh, that there's heightened sensitivity out there today uh, supply chain security is probably top of mind, whether or not you were a collateral target in some of the recent incidents, which, of course, we had a pipeline incident here with a most ransomware driven. But before that, what really got headlines was a solar burst uh, uh, incident that-, that uh, Yeah, the really, solar winds, yeah. The solar winds, yeah, that really drove this notion of what could be accomplished with a supply chain attack that had a broad range of collateral uh, targets. And well, arguably, it's not always an OT focus. The fact that IT and OT are connected today, right? Uh, certainly oh, that's a key. Attention. Yeah, that's a key piece of it, because it turns out that although OT is more and more targeted, almost all of the attacks on OT are coming from the IT side originally. And they're getting through into that OT network because OT networks are not air gapped anymore. Uh, even even OT networks that people think are air gapped, there's usually some connection that no one's noticed. Oh, that's exactly right. In fact, I think it's impossible to think about being omnipresent. But that's the the good news is right is we're we're taking strides. We're working towards raising that bar, helping helping the uh, OT system owners. And there's I know we've seen a cultural change in that regard, right? Because what it means to protect and who's charged with protecting is uh, certainly starting to take a different shape. Uh, you want to provide any insight from the European perspective? Yeah, over here in Europe, one of the, well, actually, let me go back and say that in the document, in, in our report, it shows that more and more, almost in all cases in the report, the CISO is taking over responsibility. CISO or the security organization uh, of some ilk is taking over responsibility for security and OT. And that's great news. It's very important. Uh, what I'm seeing in Europe is I'm seeing that sort of action. Uh, it may be a little bit behind North America, or if not behind, at least what I'm seeing is that those two organizations, o operations and uh, security IT, are just starting to come together in a lot of companies. Large companies, they've got it all sussed out. They've worked it out. But middle-sized uh, companies, and there's a lot of those here in, in Europe, middle-sized manufacturers, they are uh, still trying to f figure out how do I deal with the other side. IT people trying to understand what is important for operations, operations people who obviously have tremendous pressure to keep 
keep uh, production going, not shutting things down, uh, being able to express that to the IT people so that they can understand you can't just do anything willy nilly in my environment uh, with, uh, without uh, having a lot of backup plans and, and uh, planning put in place. You know, that's interesting. Uh, you and I, we engage enough customers to kind of get a good sense of what's top of mind. And I think the term resiliency is, is spoken of to a great degree, but then it's kind of defining behind the lines. Uh, the latest report they're producing kind of characterizes the discriminators of the top tier organizations, right? The fact that they have centralized visibility at their SOC, the fact that they're relying on orchestration and automation, really taking the next steps. And I think one of the other challenges and arguably was the readiness, you know, post the pandemic, you know, if, if you go back five or six quarters to the onset of, what we saw is rapid innovation, right? With the need to accommodate working from home. Certainly OT didn't get a free pass there. I know I saw that challenge here and the need to be able to figure out how to be prescriptive, but not too prescriptive because every single customer has different challenges. You wanna comment on that, Joe? Yeah, well, what we've seen is that there is already a, a move towards the integration of OT and IT, uh, but with the pandemic, that was accelerated uh, tremendously because there wasn't an option. Uh, if you look at the remote access aspect of it, it wasn't just people had, having to work from home. It was the fact that uh, for doing maintenance on machinery, the uh, original equipment manufacturers couldn't even send technicians on site to be doing that anymore. And so they had to find ways of br uh, getting in remotely. And of course, if you're letting good guys in remotely, you have to worry about are the bad guys getting in in the same manner. You know, there's a lot of terms uh, thrown about today, and I think it's all about addressing not just resilience, but the best practices. What are those things that we can help our consumers or our customers, our executive leaders think about carefully as they take those next steps in their cybersecurity journey? I know I'm, I get fascinated and geeky. We've talked about this a lot. Uh, you know, Fortinet's approach with an ecosystem, I think, is ideal. We don't just build on our own line of products, but we have a very robust technology alliance program, which allows us to manifest and reuse technology, which of course is very exciting for customers because they don't want to rip and replace everything they have out there. But I think that it goes beyond that, right? It starts to talk about things that are a part of the entire ecosystem and things that are attractive feature wise. You start talking about zero trust access and we can start to define that and think about options, right? from the use of multi-factor authentication and role-based access to techniques even as, as important as segmentation. I know you see that uh, in Europe for sure. Uh, are you seeing anything exclusively happening in that layer that will characterize as control approaches with segmentation? Well, the big thing that I'm seeing is that most companies have figured out that they've got to have a separation between the IT and the OT. Well, they, they put in place a DMZ uh, in, in Purdue model terms, you know, uh, layer 3.5. Okay. And yeah, that they pretty much got, un they've understood that. What they haven't yet been doing a lot of is going that one step further, going down in the layers and starting to micro segment, because what you want to do is you want to separate all of the machines, the PLCs, all of the, the pieces as much as possible so that if one device does get uh, attacked or, or does uh, uh, has problems, then it doesn't allow the attacker to move laterally. So you, a compromised device doesn't become a compromised factory floor or a compromised complete environment. Oh, that's exactly right. That that the idea of containment is is critical. You know, the other thing I think that's very exciting in 2021, and I think we're going to see a whole lot more emphasis as we move beyond today and even post pandemic, is this idea of uh, behavioral analytics being a part of the equation. Understanding what's going on within my OT environment. This is below the DMZ, right? Those mm. very layers we just talked about segmenting understanding behavior and being able to characterize anything that looks like an anomaly. May not, maybe it's an attack, maybe it's not, but we need to be very in, tuned into what's going on. And that, that really now involves uh, leveraging intelligence, actual intelligence that has an industrial flavor, right? From 
all of the signature kind of base things that we know we can do to taking it to a learning function and then being able to provide prescriptive language out. I know we have a FortiGuard Labs that's amazing. They're doing a, a tremendous amount of work there. Any thoughts you'd like to share in that regard? There's a whole bunch of, you know, unpacking that is is a, a whole Fortinet live in itself if, if you get down to it. But in fact, some of the things that I think uh, that come to mind when you're talking about that uh, are the fact that, first off, you need visibility. You need to know what you've got before you can try to manage it. So putting visibility, understanding which of your devices are connected in that OT environment is really important. And often when you do that, companies that I talk to are amazed at how many devices are actually connected in, in those, uh, those OT environments, sometimes now wirelessly. And we're gonna see that more and more with 5G, more and more devices that are connected. And suddenly, instead of having these devices that are below the line in that DMZ, suddenly they're not only below the line, but they're also connected to the internet uh, externally. So getting that visibility is really important. Understanding, have you already been breached or not? Uh, some of the tools that you can use uh, are things like deception technology, uh, where, for example, we've got 40 Deceptor, uh, and you can put in decoys and, and use a honeypot, attract uh, attackers into this honeypot so that they think they're in a, a Rockwell, a Siemens uh, environment, something like that, and be able to know that you're under attack, be quarantined. Now, all of that becomes information that is, is part of your intelligence and uh, your intelligence operation. 40 Guard Labs then also is seeing, well, they're seeing 100 million events around the world every single day. And so they're seeing what's happening in the broader scope and they are updating all of our devices uh, in, sometimes as often as every five minutes, depending on what we're talking about. That includes a big component of operational technology uh, threats and attacks. You know, I think it's really redefined what we mean when we talk about cyber resilience for operational technology. Gosh, you know, you, you and I could talk for hours, Joe, on this, and it's always terrific sharing ideas. Um, you know, the road ahead, I think, is exciting for OT system owners. I think there's a lot of promise. I think that we're seeing changes that allow us to be transparent, scalable, and fast. And we know all of those elements, as you just spoke to, are a part and parcel of how you're going to protect the OT leader, not just in 2021, but in the next decade, because they're looking for a long-term, uh, foolproof way that they can trust. And we're building that trust or manifesting a solution space that I think is going to build the layers of protection for operational technology that will endure. And I think that's that's uh, the, the bottom line. Joe, it's always great chatting with you. Uh, enjoyed this Fortinet live session with you. Look forward to our next conversation. Me too. I think it'll be fun. To everyone out there, thank you for watching this version of Fortinet Live. Look forward to talking again in the future. So long, everyone.